Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this last seminar of the year of the Astronomy Department of IAG USP. And uh, thank you all for participating, for being here, following via Google Meet and YouTube. And today we have this special talk by Professor uh, Zora Knezevich uh, from the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts and also from the uh, Belgrade Observatory. Astronomical Observatory of Belgrade. Professor uh, Zoran, thank you for accepting the invitation and being here today to give us the seminar. And uh, Professor Zoran, he obtained his PhD degree uh, from the Belgrade University in the late 80s and worked at the Astronomical Observatory in Belgrade from 73 uh, to uh, 2016 when he formally retired. And his research interests include several areas, including some uh, few I found the dynamical and physical processes in the solar system, long term orbital evolution of planets and asteroids, uh, secular resonances, astrometry and photometry of small solar system objects, and many other areas, uh, especially related to asteroids. And some of his professional activities uh, included. Uh, was former director of the Astronomical Observatory of Belgrade, editor in chief of the Serbian Astronomical Journal, publications of the Astronomical Observatory of Belgrade, president of the organizing committee of Commission 7, Celestial Mechanics and Dynamical Astronomy of the International Astronomical Union, chairman of the Sub Regional European Astronomy Committee member of the Board of the Geosciences and Astronomy of the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of Serbia. Professor Zola is currently in charge of the maintenance of the ASTBYS site, Asteroid Database and Proper Elements Service, and he is full member of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts. And today he is going to present the talk, Astronomical Theory of Climate Change, and questions can be asked to Professor Zora after this presentation. And if you are following the seminar to the YouTube channel, of course, you can also send your questions via the chat. And I would uh, like to ask the colleagues following the seminar via Google Meet to list them off your cameras and microphones during the presentation. And Professor Zora, please feel free to start whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction uh, and uh, let me in the beginning first thank also to Professor Silvio Perez Mello for inviting me to give this talk today at the University of Sao Paulo. What am I going to talk about uh, is What I'm going uh, to present uh, now today is uh, mostly based on uh, the work of a uh, quite uh, well-known Serbian scientist, Milutin Milankovic, who uh, actually uh, corrected and completed the astronomical theory of climate changes, with, uh, of the solutions of this theory, which actually existed before his time. And he used this theory to compute then the changes of the insulation over the uh, relatively long uh, uh, time span, that is uh, more precisely 600,000 years in the geological past. Uh, it may seem a little bit uh, even surprising to a contemporary uh, person to learn that uh, only in the beginning of the 19th century, people started to realize that the climate of the Earth has underwent uh, the dramatic changes in the past and that it uh, suffered uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, ch changes of the warm and the cold periods over the geological time spans. Uh, to this understanding, a small group of uh, enthusiasts of uh, people, uh, bright people, but are driven exclusively uh, by uh, their uh, scientific curiosity, and started to collect the data and the evidence uh, from the terrain and uh, to uh, analyze these data scientifically, interpret them in terms of 
in, in an attempt to prove that the climate of the Earth over the, chain, over the past uh, has uh, changed. Let me mention just the, the names of the, for example, uh, Playfair, uh, Chimper, Wenzel, Charpentier, Louis Agassiz, to mention but a few. Uh, uh, this evidence, which they considered, was quite well, quite interesting and, uh, and uh, different. So, for example, they uh, looked in uh, this kind of uh, uh, glacier uh, morenas. This is somewhere from the Swiss Alps. One photo of morena, and as you can uh, easily see, uh, these lateral deposits of the stone rocks, uh, stones, uh, pebbles, uh, and dust uh, indicate very clearly that, the, the, that this glacier uh, once uh, upon a time has uh, reached a much lower altitude than its uh, lower edge is uh, found nowadays. In order for the glacier to reach the lower altitudes, you need to call the weather. Then, uh, Throughout the Northern Europe, uh, people uh, could find this kind of uh, boulders. Uh, boulders which were made uh, typically of granite, but lying on the completely unfitting uh, bedrock, like basalt or some, something else. So it was clear that they could not originate in this place where they are uh, found today, but they, that they have been transported to these places in some way. Uh, for example, this particular uh, uh, granite boulder, sometimes there's these, these boulders are also called wandering stones. And uh, this one is uh, by origin from, from Norway, but it is found on the former island of Schokland in the Netherlands. Uh, it was also quite fast proposed and concluded that the only way these boulders could be transported in the positions where they are, in the locations where they are found today, could be by the act of the mighty forces of the moving ice. Among other, uh, other pieces of evidence, let's mention that the bones of the Arctic deers were found throughout the, for example, southern France, and so on. So these were more or less, uh, this kind of evidence was uh, this kind of evidence was collected, analyzed, and uh, they proposed that uh, in order to understand uh, how this evidence has, uh, has, uh, has become, has come to being, the, they uh, proposed that uh, the large ice sheets, like those which we are observing nowadays in Greenland, have uh, in the past covered all these regions in which such an evidence, such evidence was found. In perhaps about in the same time, uh, the, the expression the ice site or the ice age or their ice, their ice site or the ice age has been coined by Carl Schimper who introduced it in a poem uh, which he published. And uh, from then on, uh, we are referring to this uh, phenomena as the Ice Age. Um, perhaps the most, uh, uh, the best summary of the concept of the Ice Ages was given actually by uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, a famous uh, German poet uh, who uh, in, back in 1829 uh, said that uh, uh, simply stated that in order to have that much ice, you need a very cold weather. So I presume that uh, at least uh, one epoch of such a cold weather passed over Europe. So this was more or less the beginning of understanding of, uh, of the whole situation. Uh, however, as it is often the case in science, the new ideas are not always uh, met with uh, a lot of understanding and support and so on, but instead this idea was uh, very strongly opposed, denied, and there were a lot of people fighting against such an interpretation of the geological past of the Earth, not to forget 
that there were also religious reasons for that, because, uh, as we all know, in the Bible, only one geological phenomenon in history was described as the Great Flood, for which, by the way, we do not have any evidence that it took place. But this kind of dispute was very sharp, and it lasted almost entire, for an entire century. And only at the end of the 19th century, or the turn of the centuries, between 19th and 20th century, the couple of German geologists, Albrecht Penck and Edward Bruckner, published uh, the results of their research, where they were uh, investigating the pebble terraces in the bedrocks of uh, four small uh, rivers uh, which are found in Germany, and established that at least during the Quaternary period, that is uh, 2.6 million years in the past, there were uh, four ice ages, which they call Wirm, Ries, uh, Mendel, and Kins, after the names of these small rivers, which in which river that they have found the evidence for the ice ages, which were uh, uh, divided by the three interglacial periods, warmer periods of uh, uh, different uh, duration. Uh, even if we nowadays know that the, the history of the ice ages and the climate changes was much more complex than this uh, simple scheme of Penck and Bruckner uh, actually establishes, uh, it was uh, 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 this result was uh, so, so let's say, uh, important and good that nobody, after publishing of these results of Penck and Bruckner, anymore seriously, that no, nobody seriously really denied anymore that the ice ages occurred in the history of the Earth. Uh, however, one thing was to, to more or less uh, uh, establish that there were ice ages. In the, the, but another, completely another issue was to, 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 to show what was the reason, what caused these changes of the climate and the ice ages after all. Again, the dispute in between uh, different uh, explanations lasted, in this case, even a little bit more than one century. And the dispute was mostly in between the people who were looking for the reasons for the, ice, for the advent of the ice ages in the astronomical region in the astronomical mechanisms, uh, changing the uh, insulation of the upper bound of the atmosphere of the Earth, that is the amount of the radiation coming from the sun, and ends up in the, at the uh, upper bound of the atmosphere of the Earth, while the others were uh, uh, rather looking in uh, the reasons which are of terrestrial origin, like supervulcanism or whatever else. Uh, Milankovic was the one who actually, after, as I said, more than one century, brought to an end this, this dispute, this discussion, and resolved the problem in favor of astronomical uh, causes. It is, uh, uh, from the point of view of the historical development, it's, it's also very interesting to see how these two apparently quite different sciences, which differ in the topic of their research, methods, in the results, and so on, actually were entangled in, uh, in, uh, in some way in this, when this problem of ice ages is in question, and how the progress in one of the sciences actually give, give uh, an impact to and, the pro, and uh, pose the progress in the other one. And uh, this was a mutual, they were mutually pushing each other uh, to progress in the, this field. So here is just a short list of uh, most important names which gave contribution to, to, to both of these sciences with, uh, so that you can more or less figure out how the, the things were going more or less in a parallel way. Of course, the Lagrange was the first one who computed the secular variations of the orbital uh, elements of the Earth. Well, later on, his work was uh, complemented by or completed by, uh, by Laplace. But uh, he was using in his computations only six planets. One can say that it was a bit strange because in 1781, Uranus, that is the seventh planet, was also discovered, so he could use seven planets. Uh, Paul Coulan 
was the first one who actually computed the solutions of the long term variations of the Earth's orbit using seven planets. And later on, uh, there were uh, 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 further improvements in this theory. First and most important improvement was the improvement uh, by Leverrier in the middle of the 19th century, Urban uh, Leverrier, who was uh, who made probably even up to now perhaps the best analytical solution of the motion of the planets and of the Earth. Paradoxically, he was using seven planets and not using uh, uh, Neptune, which, which was discovered in 1846. And uh, due to him, he actually predicted, uh, when computing the theory of motion of, of uh, Uranus, he understood that there must be another planet beyond Uranus. He predicted where it, this planet should be, how big it should be. And he has uh, informed the observers in uh, one of the observatories, and the Galia was the one who just looked in the telescope and found the Neptune. So later on, Aragov said that that uh, Laplace, uh, uh, sorry, Leverrier, actually discovered the Neptune on the tip of his pen, which was essentially true. And then it seems a little bit paradoxical that uh, that uh, Leverrier uh, published his solution of the of the secular variations of the Earth's orbit by uh, using only seven planets and not Neptune. Uh, but the reason is uh, uh, understandable. Uh, very cumbersome, very complicated, and very long computations, including seven planets, were all practically completed at the time when the Neptune was discovered. So to repeat everything from scratch was almost uh, impossible. So that was the reason why Neptune, the, why uh, uh, Leverrier didn't use Neptune in his computations. This was done only later by Stockwell, by Harzer. And, uh, but for example, Milankovic comments that both Stockwell and Harzer's solution suffered from the many, uh, many errors. Finally, at the end of the century, Hill added to the theory of motion of the planets one very important, a very important uh, resonant or nearly resonant term in the motion of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn, so-called the great inequality of Jupiter and Saturn, of Jupiter and Saturn. And I think uh, my colleague, my dear colleague Silvio can tell me more about the great inequality because he published at least two or three important papers explaining the effects of the great inequality in the motion of asteroids. Uh, in the same time, on the other side, uh, Already at the beginning of the 19th century, John Herschel proposed that the reasons of the, the, the cause of the changes of the insulation or of the climate of the Earth in the past could be the changes of the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. But then he himself immediately realized that the changes of eccentricity are too weak, too small to account for the dramatic changes of the climate. In 1940, in 1940, Agassiz, Luis Agassiz, published uh, comprehensive, the results of his comprehensive research, uh, providing a lot of evidence for the occurrence of the ice ages. And this uh, caused that uh, Joseph Ademar, in 1842, tried to propose that the precession of the Earth's axis of rotation causes climate changes. Of course, the, again, this was on the good track. Uh, the proposal, but uh, it was uh, again not enough to propose only the precession to explain these uh, changes. So both these uh, proposals by Herschel and by Ademar were uh, discarded, but at least it was shown that uh, to explain the, the terrestrial phenomena, you can look also to the extraterrestrial reasons, and that is to astronomical. Uh, perhaps the most important uh, predecessor of Milankovic was uh, James Kroll, a very interesting personality. He was a Scottish, well, let's say, researcher. He was a self-taught person. He never had any formal education, but he said he was very bright, uh, obviously. Well, he was janitor in a, in a college and had uh, access to the library of the college, so he just started reading the books and became a very important researcher of his times. He proposed that uh, 
He was the first actually to correctly understand the, uh, the effect uh, of the of coupling of the eccentricity and uh, precession of the axis of rotation on the duration of the seasons. He uh, drew, drew, drew the attention also to the third astronomical mechanism, mechanism which can give rise to the changes of the, the insulation, and that is the changes of the obliquity of the axis of the Earth's rotation. He considered uh, also some other secondary effects like uh, reflection of the sun from the surface covered by ice, a change of the, the oceanic currents due to the changes of the direction and the intensity of the passat winds and so on and so forth. So it was a very, uh, his theory was very complex and uh, it, it arose a lot of attention particularly among geologists in the, in, the, in the beginning. But very soon, unfortunately, they realized that their findings from the terrain uh, do not match uh, the, the, the predictions of uh, Kroll's theory. So the Kroll's theory was also very soon abandoned and uh, more or less almost forgotten. Again, Milan, which explained that the reason why Kroll was not right, even if he was really uh, uh, taking into account everything which was really necessary was that uh, he could not take into account correctly the changes of the obliquity and that this was the reason why this theory was not good in predicting the variations of the insulation. Well, let me conclude this uh, small uh, trip through, uh, through the history of the problem by mentioning the paper or the work of uh, Ludwig Pilgrim from 1904, which was uh, very well, uh, very good, uh, and very uh, accurate in terms of the computation of the astronomical mechanisms giving rise to changes of insulation. But the problem with this, all this uh, theory, you know, all this uh, is that this, uh, the, the theory of the, the changes of insulation do, the, do not depend only on the astronomical mechanism, because astronomical mechanisms govern the amount of radiation which comes from the sun, but to, to the upper bound of the atmosphere of the Earth. Propagation of this, or the transport of this radiation through the atmosphere and the response of the surface of the Earth to the incoming radiation are the other two parts of the theory, uh, which Pilgrim didn't account correctly and which was done only by Milankovic. So uh, there were also some other attempts, uh, this, this theory, uh, the theory of Kroll, uh, to improve the theory of Kroll, but they also didn't work. So it is not uh, uh, strange that a great Austrian climatologist, Julius Hahn, uh, again at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, actually said that the effects proposed as giving rise to climate changes, he thinks about the astronomical effects, are not strong enough. Thus, from the astronomical viewpoint, one could rather expect that Earth's climate is more stable than variable. And this was the situation when Milankovic stepped to the scene. He worked on the theory of climate changes for essentially 30 years. He published his first, first paper in 1912, and he brought up all his uh, research, all his, what he has done uh, here at, from the point of view of the theory, all his computations and everything, and all the results, he wrapped up in a big book, which uh, we have called, as uh, we have seen in the, in the first slide, oops, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction, uh, Canon der Erde Bestrahlung und seine Anwendung auf des, das Zeitenproblem, or in English abbreviately translated as a canon of insulation. So, uh, Milankovic's work, uh, of course, uh, was later on, it was recognized that he was more or less correct, that everything which he had done was good, and that his results match. Uh, the findings of geology and of other sciences, and he uh, received a lot of appreciation and so on, lots of things were written about Milankovic, but one question 
to propose the, how the contemporary science looks to the Milankovitch theory, which is, as you can see, uh, at least 80 years old now. So whether it is still useful and uh, what current researchers can say about this. And here is the uh, small quotation from the seminal paper of Jacques Lascar and his group from the Paris Institute of Celestial Mechanics and the Computation of Ephemerides, in which he states that uh, since then, he thinks at times of Ivan College, since then the understanding of the climate response to the orbital pulsing has evolved, but all the necessary ingredients for the isolation computations are present in Ivan Kovic's work. There is no need for a better recognition to, to the work of uh, Milankovic given by somebody like uh, Jacques Lascar, who actually is nowadays probably one of the most important researchers in, the, in this field. Uh, after Milankovic, there were also a lot of history, a lot of, uh, but I'm not going to, to speak about this. If somebody is interested, I can provide all the references which are here mentioned. These are, again, references which cover the further development of the theory of motion of the planets and the Earth, and on the other hand, also some uh, new uh, developments in the theory of climate changes. Well, let us now switch to the theory. Let us now see what is the content of this theory, which are these astronomical mechanisms, and how do they affect the climate. Now, this is original drawing from the canon installation of Milankovic, which essentially more or less uh, uh, illustrates uh, all three mechanisms which I already mentioned. So there are three mechanisms which affect the changes of the insulation of climate, changes of the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, changes of the precession of the axis of rotation, and the changes of the obliquity of the axis of rotation. So here uh, you have this original plot which uh, shows the uh, ecliptic, the, the orbit of the Earth, here is the Sun, in the one of the focus of the oops, I, too fast, I pressed from the button, and uh, uh, SV is a normal to the, to the orthogonal to the plane of the ecliptic, SN is parallel to the axis of rotation of the Earth, so the angle VSN is actually the obliquity of the axis or the tilt of the axis of the rotation. In the same time, this is also the, the, the inclination of the plane of ecliptic to the plane of the equator. Mm -hmm. P and A are perihelion and aphelion of the orbit, which uh, actually demonstrates the fact that the orbit is slightly elongated, the orbit uh, ecliptic. And uh, this is the precession conus. And here we have a four so-called cardinal points. One and three are equinoxes, that is the nodes of the, of the orbit of the, the ecliptic with respect to the equator or vice versa. And uh, two and four are solstices. Uh, so let us now see all these uh, uh, effects one by one. Of course, I'm not going to, to, to explain what is the eccentricity. Uh, but uh, let me just show you the variation of the uh, eccentricity of the Earth in the last one million years. Just uh, as a curiosity, uh, the two uh, professors uh, of the university, okay, they were young people at that time, but uh, later became quite the well-known professors in mathematics at the University of Berlin, uh, computed for two years a new solution for the, uh, the theory of the motion of the Earth and to, to obtain this kind of curve for one million years. For two years, they have been working uh, at the Observatory of Berkeley. Uh, this curve I have got uh, in a few minutes on this uh, laptop. So the, the, there is some difference in, uh, in what we can do and uh, what they have done. So the more so we have to admire uh, them, how have they have been able to achieve this kind of results with very uh, modest uh, means. Uh, it is obvious that these uh, variations of the orbit of, uh, of the eccentricity of the orbit of the Earth are governed by only two oscillations. One has a period of around 100,000 years, and another one 
of some 400,000, 405, uh, 405, uh, 405,000 years. Well, the first one, this of 100,000 years, is actually a band, uh, is a group of uh, terms uh, which all have about the same period, close to 100,000 years. And these are the periods which come from the interaction of the terrestrial planets with Jupiter or uh, of terrestrial planets among themselves. On the other hand, this uh, term of 400 years was later on introduced by Berger in the solution of, of the computation of insulation. The language was using only this 100,000 years because, of course, he ended up his computations with 600,000 years. He could not know whether this is a periodic or not. So he just didn't consider the longer period. Uh, the 400,000 years uh, term comes from uh, as an indirect effect of the interaction between Jupiter and Venus. Then with Jupiter uh, affects the motion of Venus, Venus affects Earth, and that's what you see in this plot. Uh, there are two, I'm uh, sorry, there are two ways how eccentricity affects the, the insulation, the computation of insulation. One is obviously the fact that uh, uh, because of the eccentricity, the, the orbit of the Earth is eccentric. Let's not forget to say that the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit is currently very small. Only 0 0.0167 or 1.67%. So it's almost circular. So the eccentricity is very small. It can be as large as 6%, uh, which is also not that much, but at least much more than it is at present. Now, whatever uh, the, the different distance uh, from the sun in the period affects the amount of radiation which comes from the sun to the Earth, uh, because, of course, the radiation uh, is, inversely, is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. But more important is the term, uh, is the fact that eccentricity, as you will see in a while, affects the duration of the season. So that uh, the same amount of, uh, the, the total amount of radiation, which during one season, and when I say season, I, uh, uh, I mean uh, half a year. So summer half a year is actually spring plus summer, and the winter half a year is uh, autumn plus winter. And uh, the total uh, amount of uh, radiation is distributed over uh, different time spans. So the average, uh, insulation, uh, depending on the duration of the seasons, is different. When the season is longer, the average is uh, lower. When the season is shorter, the average is higher. And of course, you have either uh, lower temperature and, uh, or uh, higher temperature, depending on, on that. So these are two effects uh, to which the changes of eccentricity give rise. We will see later on how. Now, of course, the second uh, me mechanism is the precession of the axis. And as I think everybody in this room probably know, the precession of the axis is due to the fact that, that the shape of the Earth is not perfectly spherical, that the, that the Earth has a so-called equatorial bulge, that uh, the sort of perturbation or the, uh, gravitational pull of the sun and the moon to this equatorial bulge produces or causes the, or forces the, uh, rota the axis of rotation of the Earth to precess. The precession uh, uh, takes place in the direction, in the clockwise direction, which is the technical terms, retrograde direction, and it's opposite than the rotation of the Earth itself. Uh, since together with the, the with uh, the axis of rotation, I will again get back to this plot. Uh, axis of rotation is con contained in this plane E, which contains also the, the points of solstices, so that all four cardinal points plus this plane rotate together with the, with the axis of rotation due to the precession. And uh, sometimes uh, this phenomenon is because of that also called the, the precession of equinox. So the precession of equinoxes or precession of the axis of rotation is essentially the same. So uh, uh, 
the period which is uh, needed that, that uh, the axis of rotation uh, completes a full 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 turn that is 360 degrees or full pi is uh, uh, 26,000 years and this is called platonic year. In the same time, however, the let me again go back. In the same time, however, uh, the the great axis of the of the uh, ecliptic, and that is the line connecting perihelion and aphelion, due to the perturbations of other planets, uh, uh, also uh, re revolves or rotates, and uh, uh, it rotates in the counterclockwise direction. Which means that it is going more or less uh, towards the uh, uh, cardinal points, in particular the cardinal point, which is a vernal point or gamma point, which is uh, well known as, a, as the origin of the, of the angular variable in the plane, in the fundamental plane of, end of the uh, ecliptic spherical coordinate system. And uh, uh, so this goes towards it, and the period in between two passages of the cardinal points through the perihelion is uh, in between 19,000 and 23,000 years, but on the average 21,000 years. Now, well, well, yeah, I will, I will take uh, liberty to make a small digression. I know that here in the southern hemisphere, you are probably uh, rightly thinking that there is a bias towards the northern hemisphere. And that, uh, like uh, the left handed people, always claim that there is a bias towards the right handed people. So I think that there is a bias, for sure. And I apologize that I didn't make this uh, exercise for the southern hemisphere, but this is for the northern hemisphere. You know for very well that uh, actually due to, to the precession, also the north celestial pole changes its position in the skies. And that uh, uh, during the uh, cycle of precession, it goes uh, around uh, in the sky in this way. So of course now the north celestial pole is very close to Alpha Ursa Minoris, which is now our polar star, northern star, but 5,000 years ago, so in the period in between uh, fourth and uh, six thousand years before, uh, the, before now, uh, it was close, or sorry, in between two and four thousand years, millennia before now, uh, it was close to a, a fainter star, which is alpha of the constellation of Draco. Draco. So it is alpha Draco. And which is called Tuba. And uh, in uh, something like 12,000 years, now 2,000 years, this is now essentially, and 14,000 years will be, at 14,000 years, this will be 12,000 years from now, it will be close to the second brightest star of the northern skies, and that is the Vega in the constellation of Libra. Okay. Uh, sorry. I am again too fast. So uh, again, the question is how how this uh, uh, precession of the equinoxes affects the, the insulation. Uh, in, in, uh, in fact, uh, the let me see whether I have this equation. Yes, here. In fact, the uh, the precession is uh, uh, measured by by the longitude of perihelion uh, increased for a precession, because of course you have a longitude of perihelion for a certain epoch, for a standard epoch, and uh, over the time you have to add the precession, which goes in the clockwise uh, direction, and uh, if we again get back to our main figure. So the longitude of precession, the longitude of perihelion would be the angular distance in between the vernal equinox and the perihelion. And since vernal equinox due to precession goes clockwise, 
along the ecliptic, this means that this logic of equilibrium should be increased by the amount of precession to get this quantity, which is called the P gamma, and which is the quantity which is called sometimes also the climate, climate uh, logic of climate precession. This the equation, the simple equation, gives uh, the, the, the difference in between uh, the, uh, duration of the uh, season in the summer uh, half year and in the winter half year. T is a period of the Earth, one year, T is eccentricity. So for a given eccentricity, when P gamma uh, reaches 90 degrees, then this difference is maximum which means that the maximum that the summer, uh, summer season is the longest and the winter season is shortest. As I already said, when the season is longer, the average uh, amount of uh, radiation which comes to the upper bound of the atmosphere of the Earth decreases, the amount uh, per, per unit time, uh, while uh, when the, it is short, then it increases. In the, this case, when we are in the maximum of this difference, and for the present uh, value of the eccentricity, you can make the own computation very easily. It is seven and a half days is this difference. But when the eccentricity is in the maximum of 0.06, uh, then this difference can be as large as 27, 28 days, almost one month. So this is really a lot. So what happens is that uh, here we have the decrease of the amount of irradiation on the during summer and increase of the radiation of, of the winter part, part year, which means that we are actually uh, diminishing or decreasing the seasonal contrast in between summer and winter. So this is the way how the, this effect uh, change the, the the precession of the axis changed the, the insulation. Of course, this is again for the northern hemisphere and it's just opposite for the southern hemisphere. Now, when we have this kind of situation, then the summers are long but mild. And uh, as shown by a great friend of Milutin Milankovic and the father-in-law of famous Alfred Wegener, who was the father of the theory of the plate tectonics, and this was the Austrian climatologist Vladimir Kepen. Kepen uh, showed that actually this is the situation in which, which favors the accumulation of the ice. So the formation of the permanent cover of the ice. So the permanent cover of the ice does not. Uh, it is a bit contraintuitive. So one would say, well, very cold winters will uh, produce a lot of ice, and this will uh, make uh, the, 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 this will give rise to the growth of the ice sheets. No. It is opposite. The mild summers during which the, the ice which was created during the winter does not melt completely because the temperature is not high enough. There, there, this is the situation which favors creation of the ice sheets. And that it is really so, just think of, of, of today, Siberia. Siberia is a, during the winter, there's a temperature which plummets down to minus 50, minus 60. But Siberia does not have a permanent ice sheet. And the reason is that during the summer, all of this ice which was accumulated uh, just uh, melts and melts away, and there is no creation of the permanent ice sheet. So, this is uh, the way how essentially the precession uh, acts through the through the, uh, the seasonal contrast, how the precession actually acts to change the climate. Oh, sorry. Now the third mechanism, uh, maybe I will, I, I will, I have just to, to, to say also that uh, in the previous case, or the case of precession, uh, the precession uh, with this uh, game of the changing of the duration of the seasons, actually uh, uh, acts on the two hemispheres of the Earth differently. Because all the other mechanisms uh, uh, act on both hemispheres uh, in, the, in the same way. So this is the one which gives the difference in between, in between the northern and the southern hemisphere. And this was one of the difficult problems to, 
solved in the previous models of the climate changes. Now, the third uh, mechanism is the change of the obliquity of the axis of rotation. Uh, well, there is no much uh, to say. There is a axis of rotation, uh, the normal to the ecliptic. This is the angle which we call obliquity. And here you can see a plot of the changes of the obliquity for the next one million years. So the red point gives the current position of the obliquity. And as you can see, the obliquity at present is more or less just is 23 point something, if I remember correctly. And it is at more or less at the middle of the range, which is not completely equal and so on. But on the average, uh, the period is 41,000 years. And it is also uh, decreasing. Now, how the change of the obliquity affects the climate? First, uh, the change of obliquity changes the angle, the incident angle, incident angle of the radiation which comes from the sun on the upper bound of the Earth's atmosphere. And as you can, of course, what everybody knows. Uh, this simple thing that uh, the amount of radiation which uh, comes uh, uh, under some angle is distributed over the larger area. So in this case, we have a larger or, or sorry, smaller amount of insulation per unit area. In the previous case, we had per unit time. Now we have per unit area. And uh, of course, uh, as of course we all know uh, that uh, um, Something, if you, if you have an angle of 45 degrees as the incidence angle, uh, only something like 70% of the irradiation which comes to the surface of the Earth if the radiation comes orthogonally. So we receive much less energy if the angle is here. So where, it, uh, where this effect is most important in the polar areas, of course, because the Earth is spherical, here the, the polar uh, regions, uh, the, uh, the angle of the incidence of the radiation is already small. So even the small changes, because I forgot to say that, uh, that uh, the angle is, uh, the, this angle is, uh, the changes of this angle are quite small. The amplitude of the change is something like uh, four degrees only. So one would say four degrees is not much. Why it causes so much, uh, so much of the, change in the insulation. Well, it does, but not everywhere. It causes a lot of change uh, where the uh, incidence angle is already small. So here, a change of uh, four degrees can change significantly the amount of irradiation, but not at the equator. So the pole, the change of the uh, obliquity uh, angle changes much more the, the insulation than at the equator. So you have what we call geographical contrast. And if the angle increases, of course, the amount of radiation which comes for the larger angle to the polar regions reduces the geographical contrast. Because on the equator, it doesn't change almost anything. It just changes in the, in the poles. Actually, Milan, which computed that uh, if the uh, axis of rotation of the Earth would, would be implied by 54 degrees, the polar region and the equatorial region would be the same. We have the same amount of insulation. So no geographical contrast. So this is one way to change. And the other way is uh, uh, changes of the winter or the summer part and the winter part of the total radiation, uh, which given parallel, uh, this is latitude phi, uh, receives in the course of summer and winter half years. Because J, J, T is again uh, the period of rotation of the Earth, one year. Uh, J0 is a so called solar con constant, which is the value, I think, uh, 1.367 uh, watts per meter square. This is the amount of radiation which comes from the sun, continuously comes from the sun, uh, to the surface area of one square meter in uh, unit time, one second. And, uh, uh, per unit time, and uh, in the case uh, orthogonally to the to the surface, and in the case that the distance in between the sun and the Earth is exactly one kilometer. 
Uh, this is the definition of the solar constant. And uh, it is clear from uh, this small uh, simple equation that uh, if you increase angle or the obliquity angle, this difference will increase and we will receive more radiation in the in the summer and less in the winter, which increases the seasonal contrast. So in this case, we have both geographical contrast and the seasonal contrast. So all of these together, uh, of course, the eccentricity appears here, as you can see, uh, which is already very small as a quantity to the square. So eccentricity does not play an important role, except uh, for the duration of the seasons, which I already said in the very beginning. All these three things taken together, all these three quasi-periodic uh, changes taken together, uh, gave uh, Milankovic the possibility to compute what is called the, the, his famous curve of insulation, and which is given in particularly uh, interesting units. So he called these units canonical units, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the, the, the situations, uh, the, 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 the way of representing the changes of the insulation is the following. He has computed the amount of radiation come, which comes to each latitude from zero to 90 in both uh, hemispheres. Then he took a 65th uh, 65 degrees, uh, the parallel at the 65 degrees of, of latitude. Well, there is a special reason. I have no time now to, to enter also into these details. There is a special reason why just, why just 65, but let's say he took a 65 and then computed how, uh, and this is the amount of radiation or isolation which comes to this uh, latitude now. And then he computed how much, uh, uh, what is the latitude now, which receives the same amount of insulation in some uh, uh, instant in the past. So, for example, 10,000 years ago, the, uh, the latitude of 65 degrees received the amount of insulation, which nowadays receives the latitude 60. That means more. Because the 60, latitude 60, receives more insulation than the latitude 65. 230 years ago, the same the latitude of 65 degrees received the amount of insulation which today receives the latitude 77. That is much less. And when it is much less, this means that we are in the cold period. And as a matter of fact, these, uh, uh, all these uh, here, uh, areas which are uh, uh, not, not shadow, but uh, what is the term in English? I can't remember. Okay. But, uh, which are marked with this kind of, uh, of gray. Uh, they, these represent the uh, Milankovic predicted ice ages in the 600,000 years in the past. And here are given the same, the, 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 here uh, you see down there the new uh, improved uh, classification of geological periods. I mentioned that there were just four, and now they said this was the work of uh, Zergel and other uh, more recent uh, geologists who increased the, the time resolution of, uh, the, of their findings and claimed that there are at least 11 ice ages, but all these 11 ice ages, and in this case, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, uh, the other two are a uh, little bit more to the past, perfectly agree with uh, what they found from geology, this is here, and perfectly agree with what uh, uh, was predicted in Markov's theory. So this was essentially, let's say, uh, a way, uh, in a way, a triumph of this uh, computation and uh, proof that uh, you can predict the, the changes of the climate by using astronomical uh, evidence. Now, uh, I can stop either here or if you want, I can continue with a few more uh, simple things. So I don't know what is the, what is the time. Have I 
for the ready. Was it you? Used uh, well, I will for another five minutes, maybe sure. something like that. Not not too much. Well, it was not easy for him to compute. I already said uh, how my, how long uh, did it take to compute the theory of the motion of the Earth in 1930s? It was in 1930s, this two-year computation. And on top of that, Milankovic had uh, the problems with the uh, accuracy of the parameters used in the theory, like masses and so on. Ah, but I forgot to say that uh, after these computations were done and published, uh, these uh, three cycles, uh, eccentricity cycle of 100,000 years, obliquity cycle of 41,000 years, and precession cycle of 21,000 years, have got the name uh, the Milankovitch cycles. Now, the problems which he had in his computation are given, for example, an example is given here. These are masses which were used by Leverrier, whose theory Milankovic was using in the beginning, before this computation was done at the observatory in Belgrade. These are the values used by Milankovic, and these are current values used, uh, which are uh, more or less uh, determined by the passage of the, of the spaceship. Uh, that's what I did, short distance from the big planet, so these are most accurate values stored today. Of course, these are given in the reciprocal uh, values of the, uh, these are inverse values of the uh, mass of the, of the mass of the given planet in terms of the uh, mass of the sun, which is usual way how we in celestial mechanics uh, take into account masses. In the same as you can see that uh, Leverrier's and Milankovic values were quite different, which uh, justifies the new computation while JPL and Milankovic differ less, but still they differ. Here is another uh, problem. Uh, here is the constant of precession. Milankovic was using this value. Uh, today's uh, official uh, solution is this value, and Lascar et al. in 2004 computed that value. Now it seems that they are in a good agreement, but if you take this small difference uh, and multiply it with 600,000 years, this is the Recession per year. If you multiply it with 600,000 years, you arrive to the error of 20 degrees. So this is already, that's the reason why Milanko stopped at 600,000 years. He could go further, but uh, he just said, no, no, it will not be accurate enough. So he didn't want to go there. So these are the, the value, the, the results of this computation. This I already shown. And uh, let me try to more or less finish my presentation by saying a few words on the proofs uh, of the language theory. I have already said about the good agreement between the logic, geological record and the theory and the predictions of the theory, but this was not the same. This was not the only, these were not the only proofs of the theory. Milankovitch actually didn't live to, to, to uh, didn't live to, to have, to, to see his theory definitely proved. He died in 1958, and his theory was definitely proved in 1976 with the so-called CLIMAP project, which was uh, uh, realized in 1971 when they took a samples from the bottom of the Indian Ocean and just analyzed the different things, uh, the finding that uh, the change of the cold and, and warm uh, periods uh, of temperatures of the sea uh, exactly match the Milankovic's predictions. I will not enter into too many details, just to say that uh, in 1976 it was definitely proven. Of course, they have used uh, either the ratio of the isotopes of the oxygen, which is a good uh, indicator of the different, of the temperature of the sea water, um, the deposits of the foraminifera, these are from nanoplanktons, uh, different uh, the, the small animals uh, whose shells actually contain different uh, ratio of the isotope or we know that some of them live only in the warm seas, some only in the cold seas and so on. So this was the way to more or less assess the changes of the temperature of the water and so on. These are some of these uh, nano and this is an interesting thing. This is the famous Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which is uh, 65 million years ago, when uh, we claimed that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. And probably this was so, but uh, it was not the, only that he killed dinosaurs. 
the asteroid killed 70% of the biosphere and also in the, in the sea. So you can see before KT boundary, the abundance of the nanoplankton and above much less, which means that actually the, we had a, what we today call the nuclear winter after the heat on the asteroid. Here is the, uh, Milankovic always uh, uh, wanted that his theory is universal. That it solves the problem uh, in universal terms. It doesn't uh, solve only the problem of the ice ages of the Earth, but also in general. So he was very proud that he was able to compute the temperature from the four terrestrial planets plus moon. He was the first person who computed the temperature at the surfaces of these planets. And uh, uh, whether the climate changes uh, uh, act also on the other planets, here is very nice uh, photograph of the Becquerel crater on Mars, where you see that uh, you have uh, 10, 10 of these cycles uh, with, uh, which are embedded in these bigger uh, variations, of, and these are due to the changes of the obliquity of the Mars uh, axis of rotation, for which we know that it has a shorter period term of 125,000 uh, years and modulated by the bigger um, oscillation of uh, 1.2 million years and comprising just 10, exactly the 10 shorter periods. And you can see this very well in these deposits on the wall of the Mars crater. These are also some other results of Lascar about the Earth's motion, the chaos of the, of the planetary motion, the obliquity of the Earth changes over 500 million years, which are essentially monotonously increasing, except for this uh, time around zero, that is our present period, when uh, the Earth is passing through a resonance, and due to this resonance, the obliquity started to, to drop. And then when we get out from the resonance, it will increase to, to uh, increase in this way as before. Uh, this is the duration of the rotation of the Earth. And uh, these are the limiting factors which uh, prevent that we compute the changes of the, of the, of the insulation and of the climate in the period longer than 60 or uh, 70 million years either in the past or in the future, because there are chaotic effects in the motion of the Earth, which, which we cannot really compute, and not only the chaotic effects, but also these are other uh, limiting factors. So for the moment, we cannot go as far as we like, even if uh, we have a good computers with which we can integrate the motion of the Earth for as long as we like. But the results have no physical meaning beyond this. Uh, are the Milankovic's uh, cycles still uh, interesting in the science? Well, these are the two recent papers which discuss essentially the climate zones in Pluto and Charon and the uh, exo-Milankovic cycle, that is the Milankovic cycles in the exoplanets. The lot of uh, recognition received Milankovic most after his death. So there is a crater on the Mars, which is named after Milankovic. There is a crater on the Moon, which bears his name. This is the Milankovic crater. And there is a minor planet, which is named after him, the asteroid, and so on. In Belgrade, we have a big boulevard uh, in the new part of the city, and park in the old part of the city, named after Milankovic. And if you allow me to show you, This is the banknote from, from, uh, from uh, Serbia, where Milankovic is, uh, Milankovic is, uh, uh, is on this banknote. The second uh, biggest banknote which exists in another country. There is only one big. Uh, so that, that would be it. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. I apologize if I exaggerated this completely. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zora. Thank you, it was a, a very clear talk. Now we can open for if someone has uh, some questions, some comments. So. Mm -hmm.
No, uh, thank you for your talk. It was very clear. Uh, I have a question. You just mentioned very quickly about the semi-major axis of the Earth. Of the Earth. And, uh, but uh, I, I didn't get if it's important or not, it's variation. Uh, can you comment on that? For the, for the, yes. Uh, well, it was actually the, I was talking about something else. This was the uh, great axis of the, of the which uh, due to the perturbation, well, okay, this is in the beginning. I will try to, to come to this here. So the great axis, which is the axis, it's not semi major axis. So semi major axis is half of it. But, uh, and this is the, the orbital element, the Clarion orbital element. But here we are talking about the great axis which connects the, the perihelion and aphelion. And due to the perturbations, the perihelion and aphelion also rotate. They change the orientation in the space. So actually going in the direction of uh, cardinal points. So these uh, variations are uh, counterclockwise. They are due to perturbations by different uh, other planets. So perihelion moves on the orbit due to the perturbations by the other planets and goes counterclockwise. Precession drives uh, the cardinal points equinox, or gamma points, vernal equinox, uh, drives uh, clockwise. So they are going towards to each other, and then the passage of the, uh, equi of the uh, equinox through the perihelion uh, is uh, takes place uh, in the period which is shorter than the platonic period. So that was the part. And this is important for the climate because this peak gamma uh, uh, angle, which is taken into account, contains also precession. Actually, I was thinking about the size of the same major axis of the distance from Earth to the sun. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, well, as it is well known, the, the same major axis does not, uh, uh, not only of Earth, but of any body, uh, is a calculating element which uh, essentially does not uh, suffer from the secular variations uh, up to the second or third order in the mass. And uh, uh, therefore, the, the, what it suffers are only short periodic changes. And if I remember correctly, I have done some calculations computation that short periodic changes of the Earth's axis change the, the distance by the amount of something like from uh, minimum to maximum by, uh, by amount of something like 6 million kilometers. When you compare it with the 150 million kilometers of the, of the average uh, distance in between Sun and, the, and, uh, and the Earth, which is essentially the average value of the centimeter axis, this is not much. This is not much. But uh, uh, that's it. But uh, uh, and then, since this is a short period of perturbations, or uh, and the, the, the Earth is not resonant, these these oscillations after a while, uh, after some very long period of time, if you average them out, you get zero. So that's uh, okay, thank you. that's the, the the reason why the solar system is, by the way, stable. That the, the planets are not going uh, anywhere. They are staying there. there. More questions? I, I myself I have uh, two short questions. One is uh, is there some possible situation where these uh, variations in the climates? I don't know if this question makes sense. Push a planet out of the habitable zone. There could be some situation where these variations are uh, the amplitude is so high, the temperature that it, for example, for the Earth would push the Earth out of the habitable zone. For example, some big planets in the solar system. Then another question is, when is the next uh, ice age on Earth? That's a nice question. Well, the first question is essentially I have just got more or less answered. The changes of the same major axis of the planets are so small uh, that uh, we have essentially proven that the solar system is stable over its own lifetime. So in the next four and a half billion years, the planets will not move anywhere, so they will stay where they are, unless there is some strange uh, uh, passage of the other star close to the solar system, but it has to pass very close. It's not any passage will not do anything to the, to the planets. They can perturb the Oort cloud of comets, which is uh, very far, 150,000 astronomical units, but something which is one astronomical unit from the sun isn't going to be perturbed. So the solar system is stable, there will be no 
this kind of uh, problem. And the second question was, when will be the next? Well, this is a very interesting question, because you have seen that uh, the, the, the eccentricity of the Earth is currently very small. And it will stay in that way for a long time, for another 50,000 years, at least. This is what our computations show. And uh, from the, the, the equation of the, of the change of the, the duration of the seasons, which I have shown, you see that when the eccentricity is small, the change of the duration of the seasons is small. Currently, is the seven and a half days. So summer season on the northern hemisphere is longer than the winter season and opposite in the, in the southern hemisphere. So this is not much. It's not that much. So, uh, so this will remain for a long time. And therefore, the climate is not going to, to suffer too many changes. What I wrote, uh, what I read you yesterday or the day before yesterday, just looking at some of the data on the on the on the, what we are doing to the climate at present, some say that the, 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 the amount of carbon which we deposited by now to the to, to the atmosphere that they will prevent the changes of the climate due to the astronomical uh, uh, for another 500,000 years if we now stop. For Whether this model is correct or not, I don't know. But it is uh, an interesting, uh, interesting news. <laughs> so we will have uh, apparently. Well, on the other hand, uh, one has to also take into account that uh, all these are, uh, let's say, very important, very nice uh, results, but historical in a way. Nowadays, the climatologists claim that we are all the time in the cold period. That that, uh, that uh, all these what we see are small variations over, over one uh, one very long. Uh, essentially cold period in the, in, the, in the history of Earth because you know, Earth passed through much warmer periods which lasted also tens of maybe hundreds of millions of years. Therefore, we have deposits of the, of the coal, of the oil, and so on and so forth. So it's not clear when there will be a, well, depends on, uh, on the different things and including the anthropogenic uh, influence of climate. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much for, for your talk. I have two questions also. One is uh, how much, uh, how constant is the, uh, the sun in the model? I meaning the changes in the sun, even small changes like, like fair degree changes, are going to affect the prediction in 100, yes. 100 years. Sure, there is. There are. There, there is a modeling of the change of the insulation of the Earth due to the fact that the sun might, so the solar constant will not be constant. So it will change. However, uh, as I said, uh, first Milankovitch, uh, Milankovitch theory of the covered by Milankovitch theory is too small that, uh, that you observe any change on yeah. the sun, because these changes take much more time. On the other hand, uh, even uh, as I, I, I showed these limiting uh, factors which uh, uh, prevents computation of the insulation over very long uh, periods of time. They are still shorter than uh, expected uh, change of the solar uh, radiation uh, due to the mass loss to whatever and so on. So uh, in the end, uh, for this kind of climate changes, this kind of effect is not important. It would be important if we are able to extend the computations which we are doing now to much longer period in that case, yes, absolutely, we should take into account also the changes of the solar constant. Okay, thank you. And I have a, a second question that can be related to your comment about the, the, the issue of carbon emissions. Uh, it's related to the duration, duration of each of these minimum. The, the, this duration is, uh, the, let's say, the, the the period, uh, it depends much on, uh, let's say, astronomical things, on, on internal things, on the atmosphere, and so the Earth. To be frank, I don't know, because uh, I am not a climatologist. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what I said to, uh, just uh, about this uh, 500,000 years uh, of uh, essentially uh, uh, preventing the astronomical uh, uh, mechanisms to work on the climate, is something which I also read from the, some climatologic uh, modeling. 
So I'm not sure. Uh, probably um, many more different things which you have to take into account. Now they are taking into account million things, including the, for example, the, the spread of the of the uh, wood on the surface of the earth, because the wood uh, is dark and absorbs more radiation than, for example, ice. Ice is shrinking, uh, the woods are shrinking, so the, everything is is uh, shrinking, <laughs> so who knows where we will end up. Yeah. But uh, uh, let's say that uh, in the first place, this uh, anthropogen uh, uh, effects on the on the climate are uh, essentially on the different time scales. But here we are talking about tens of thousands of years, maybe millions of years, and in Africa, uh, this anthropogen uh, effect to the climate are 100 years old. And uh, we think that they are very fast much faster than the others, so we will see. Thank you. Questions? No, let's uh, think again, Professor Pozorum. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Can I get rid of this? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if Richard is following you. I think no, we okay. can uh, uh, stop the broadcasting. Uh, I'm going to cut. Thank you. Thank you.